Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2024. Welcome to lesson number 13, The Triumph of God's Love. Ready for teaching on June 29, the author of the series of lessons on the Great Controversy was Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, June 22. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you as we come to the end of this series of lessons. We thank you that we know that there is a plan, that you have a plan for each of us. And that plan is our salvation. And Jesus came and lived and died and rose again for us so that we could have that salvation. And we have the opportunity of sharing it with others. But we know that before he comes back again to take us with him, that there will be difficult times. And we thank you that your word gives us hope and gives us the knowledge of your love and what you will do for us. Bless us as we open your word. May your Holy Spirit guide us and may our minds be enlightened. And today I'd like to pray for Takwemo Zamo, Rebecca from Uganda, from Mara Francis and uh, Dean Small, and for those who are listening in difficult places quite often, in Kuwait and Doha and for those in South Africa and in Indonesia and in Tonga and Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands and in, in Chile, Lord, wherever people are listening, I pray that you'll be with them and bless them right now as they listen. In Jesus' name, amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Let's read that again, Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. We can face the future with hope. Although challenging times are coming, whatever suffering we must go through, whatever hardships we must endure, whatever sorrows we experience, if we have hope, a better day is coming. We can live life today with purpose and joy. Franklin D. Roosevelt was president during 1933 to 1945, one of the most difficult periods of United States history. He was paralysed by polio and unable to walk unaided. He once wrote, We have always held to the hope, the belief, the conviction that there is a better life, a better world beyond the horizon. Albert Einstein, one of the world's most brilliant men, wrote, Learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. And Alfred Lord Tennyson, a popular English poet during Queen Victoria's reign, once wrote, Hope smiles from the threshold of the year to come, whispering, It will be happier. In this quarter's final lesson, we will see Christ's steadfast love during the most exciting time in the history of the universe and his complete triumph in the great controversy. The Bible's last book, Revelation, gives us hope for today, tomorrow, and forever. Sunday, June 23, Hope in the Time of Trouble Read Revelation 22, verses 11 and 12, Daniel 12, 1 and 2, and Jeremiah 30, verses 5 to 7. What events occur just before the second advent? First of all, Revelation 22, beginning at verse 11. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. 
Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to every person according to what they have done. And Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people everywhere, whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And Jeremiah 30, beginning at verse 5, this is what the Lord says, Cries of fear are heard, terror, not peace. Ask and see, can a man bear children? Then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labour, every face turned deathly pale? How awful that day will be! No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. The close of human probation is followed by a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. Revelation 16 describes seven last plagues that will be poured out on the wicked world. But, as with the plagues that fell on Egypt, God's people will be shielded from them. Note the promise of Daniel in Daniel 12 verse 1, And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. This must be referring to the book of life. As we see in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. And then Revelation 13, verse 8, All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. And Revelation 20, verse 12, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And Revelation 20, verse 15. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And Revelation 22, verse 19. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this scroll. If we have stayed faithful to Jesus, our names will not be blotted out of the book of life. Revelation 3 verse 5 The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Read 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 to 3, John 8:29 and John 14:30. What is the only sufficient preparation for the coming time of trouble? 1 John chapter 3 beginning at verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. And John eight twenty nine, The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. And John 14, verse 30, I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. In the time of trouble, People have a personal relationship with Jesus so deep that nothing can change it. Their consummate desire is to please Him in all things, so that through the work of the Holy Spirit they will be as pure as He is pure. 
There was nothing in Christ's heart that responded to Satan's deceptions. We can reflect this aspect of his character as well. Read Psalm 27, verse 5, Psalm 91, verses 1 to 11, and Revelation 3, 10 to 12. What reassuring promises does God give us for the time of trouble? Psalm 27, 5, For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. And Psalm 91, beginning at verse 1. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the foulest snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And Revelation 3, beginning at verse 10. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. There are some who have misunderstood the concept of living through the time of trouble without a mediator. Jesus ceases his mediation in heaven's sanctuary when everyone has made their final decision for or against him. But this does not mean we are alone during this time, trusting our own strength. Jesus has assured us he will be with us always. As you read in Matthew twenty-eight twenty, And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. Faith trusts when it cannot see, and believes even when the world around us is falling apart. During the time of trouble, our faith strengthens and our longing for eternity increases so that our one desire is to live forever with Jesus. Monday, June 24, Hope in Jesus' Soon Return Read John 14, 1-3 and Titus 2, 11-14 in the light of the challenges of the future and the coming time of trouble, why are these verses so encouraging? John 14, beginning at verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. And Titus 2, beginning at verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Jesus' words, 
Let not your heart be troubled, are his reassurance that he will never leave us and is coming again to take us home. This world is not our home. A better day is coming. Once in every 25 verses, the New Testament speaks of the return of our Lord. When the days are dark and the oppressive enactments of the church-state power threaten our lives, the promise of Christ's coming fills our hearts with hope. This is the blessed hope that has inspired the faithful people of God in every generation. Read Revelation 6, verses 15 to 17, and Isaiah 25, verses 8 and 9. Contrast the attitudes of the saved and the lost revealed in these verses. What explains the difference between these two mindsets? Revelation 6, beginning at verse 15. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? And Isaiah 25, beginning at verse 8. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The wicked realize the horrible consequences of sin while the righteous have accepted the marvelous provisions of grace. Rebellion against God leads to fear, guilt, condemnation and eventually eternal loss. Our response to his saving grace leads to forgiveness, peace and joy eternally at his glorious return. Read Revelation 15 verses 3 and 4 and chapter 19 verse 7. How will the redeemed respond to the glorious salvation provided so freely through Christ? Revelation 15 beginning at verse 3 and sang the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And chapter 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. In the Great Controversy, page 650, we read, The cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. In Christ glorified, they will behold Christ crucified. That the maker of all worlds, the arbiter of all destinies, should lay aside his glory and humiliate himself from love to man will ever excite the wonder and adoration of the universe. End of quote. And so to finish today, read Revelation twelve seventeen, Revelation seventeen, thirteen and fourteen, and chapter nineteen verses eleven to sixteen. Carefully notice the progression of these verses. What does the progression of these verses say about the earth's last war and Christ's ultimate victory? Revelation 12 and verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's command and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. And Revelation 17, beginning at verse 13, They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. 
and Revelation 19, beginning at verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has his name written. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Tuesday, June 25, The Millennium on Earth Revelation 19 ends with the dramatic portrayal of the return of Jesus and the destruction of the wicked. But the story is not over. Revelation 20 introduces us to a period lasting 1,000 years known as the Millennium. Read Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. What is Satan's fate when Jesus returns? Revelation 20, beginning at verse 1. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. The imagery in Revelation 20 verses 1 to 3 is symbolic. Satan is not literally bound with a chain and locked in a pit. For 1,000 years he is confined to this desolate, depopulated earth, bound by the circumstances he himself has created. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4, we read that Satan and his angels were reserved for punishment by chains of darkness. Let's read that verse, Second Peter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Satan will be confined to the earth by a chain of circumstances with no one to tempt. For 1,000 years he will see the devastation, destruction and disaster that his rebellion has created. The Greek word translated bottomless pit is the same word from which we get our English word abyss. It also is the same word used in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, to describe the earth at creation. Genesis 1-2 reads, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. In the Septuagint, the word deep here is the Greek word abyssos, A-B-Y-S-S-O-S, -S, abyss. It describes a desolate earth. The bottomless pit is not some subterranean cavern or some yawning chasm somewhere out there in the universe. Satan's work of sin and destruction, along with the tremendous chaos preceding the second coming, has brought the earth back to a dark, disorganized mass like its condition at the beginning of creation. Read Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 23 to 26, and Jeremiah 25, verse 33. How does the biblical prophet describe this scene? Jeremiah 4, beginning at verse 23. I looked at the earth, and it was formless and empty, and at the heavens, and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking, all the hills were swaying. I looked, and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. And then Jeremiah 25, verse 33. At that time, those slain by the Lord will be everywhere, from one end of the earth to the other. 
They will not be mourned or gathered up or buried, but will be like dung lying on the ground. The prophet here emphasizes the catastrophic destruction at the second coming of Christ, and that no person is left alive on earth during this thousand-year period. Satan and his evil angels are left to contemplate the havoc caused by his rebellion. The entire universe recognizes anew that the wages of sin is death. God deals with the sin problem so that it will never rise again. Nahum 1 verse 9. Let's look at that whole text. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. There are three prime ways God does this. First, he reveals his limitless love, passionate desire, and relentless efforts to save all humanity. Second, he reveals his justice, fairness, and righteousness. Third, he allows the universe to see the ultimate results of sin and rebellion. Wednesday, June 26, Judgment in the Millennium. Read Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6. What are the righteous doing during the 1,000 years, and why is it important? Revelation 20, beginning at verse 4. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and have not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. During the millennium, the righteous will have an opportunity to observe firsthand God's justice and love in how he has dealt with the sin problem. Who doesn't have questions they would like to ask God about a lot of things? Now, during the millennium in heaven, the redeemed get to ask those questions. If a loved one or close friend is absent from heaven, the saved have the opportunity to understand God's decisions more fully. In a new way, more forcefully than ever before, the redeemed will grasp God's powerful attempts to save every person who has ever lived. They will realize anew that everyone who is lost has missed out on heaven because of their own personal rejection of Christ. Only then does God bring final judgment, the second death, which is eternal destruction on the lost. Read Revelation 20 verses 7 to 9. How do the 1,000 years conclude? What is the fate of Satan and his followers? Revelation 20, beginning at verse 7. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. For one thousand years, Satan has had no one to tempt or deceive. He and his angels have been alone to reflect on the deadly consequences of sin. At the end of the millennium, the wicked dead are resurrected to face the judgment and receive their final reward, as we read in Revelation 20 verse 5. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Now Satan has a vast army of followers. Although Satan has suffered defeat after defeat in the great controversy, he is encouraged as he sees the huge throng of the lost. Not yet ready to end his rebellion, he goes out to deceive these nations. Satan inspires them to make 
one last great effort to overthrow God and set up their own kingdom. The term Gog and Magog is used to symbolise Satan and the unsaved of all ages. Satan and his followers surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city, we read in verse 9 of Revelation 20. At the close of the millennium, not only are all the wicked raised to life, but the holy city, New Jerusalem, descends to earth from heaven, as we read in Revelation 21 verse 2. I saw the holy city, the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. The saints have been living and reigning with Christ in the New Jerusalem for the millennium. Now, at the end of the 1,000 years, the city descends to earth along with God, Jesus, the angels, and all the redeemed. Everyone is present for the final battle of the great controversy. Sin is about to be eradicated once and for all. And so to finish today, what does the timing of the final judgment say about God's character? Thursday, June 27, Two Eternities Read 2 Corinthians 5.10, Romans 14, verses 10 and 11, and Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. What do they say about why the wicked are raised to life again? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And Revelation 14, verses 10 and 11. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister, or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. And Revelation chapter 20, beginning at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. To resolve the sin problem, so evil never arises again, Everyone must be convinced that God has been fair and just in all his ways. Ultimately, every knee shall bow and acknowledge God's justice in the great controversy, even Satan and his evil angels, and that there was never any justification for rebellion against God. Notice this insight from Ellen White from page 666 of The Great Controversy. As soon as the books of record are opened and the eyes of Jesus looks upon the wicked, they are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. They see just where their feet diverge from the path of purity and holiness, just how far pride and rebellion have carried them in the violation of the law of God. The seductive temptations which they encouraged by indulgence in sin the blessings perverted, the messengers of God despised, the warnings rejected, the waves of mercy beaten back by the stubborn, unrepentant heart, all appear as if written in letters of fire. And then in page 668, the whole wicked world stand arraigned at the bar of God on the charge of high treason against the government of heaven. They have none to plead their cause. They are without excuse and the sentence of eternal death is pronounced against them. End of quote. Read Revelation 20, verse 9, Psalm 37, 20, and Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. What insights do these passages give us about the ultimate destruction of sin and sinners 
and the reward of the righteous. Revelation 20 and verse 9. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves, but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And Psalm 37 verse 20. But the wicked will perish. Though the Lord's enemies are like the flowers of the field, they will be consumed. They will go up in smoke. And Malachi 4 verses 1 and 2. Surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. The good news is that Satan and his evil angels will be destroyed in the lake of fire. Sin and sinners will be consumed. According to Revelation 20 verse 9, they will be devoured, destroyed and not eternally tormented. The next verse uses the expression forever and ever. Depending on the context, the word forever does not always mean endless, but until something is completely accomplished. As we read in Exodus 20, verse 6, Then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. And then we read in 1 Samuel 1, 22, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. And Jude, oh, sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 28, So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. And Jude, verse 7, In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. And Second Peter 2, verses 4 to 6, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes, and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. For the lost, the destruction itself, not the act of destroying, is eternal. God is not the eternal torturer. And so to finish the day, in the end, one of two eternities await us all. The lost, unfortunately, receive the wages they have earned, eternal death. Why then is our only hope of not getting what we deserve, which is death, found in trusting in Jesus' righteousness? Friday, June 28, Further Thought From the Great Controversy, page 675, we read, there the wide-spreading plains swell into hills of beauty, and the mountains of God rear their lofty summits. On those peaceful plains, besides those living streams, God's people, so long pilgrims and wanderers, shall find a home. And then page 677. There immortal minds will contemplate with never-failing delight the wonders of creative power, the mysteries of redeeming love. There will be no cruel, deceiving foe to tempt to forgetfulness of God. Every faculty will be developed, every capacity increased. The acquirement of knowledge will not weary the mind or exhaust the energies. There the grandest enterprises may be carried forward, the loftiest aspirations reached, the highest ambitions realised. And still, there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the power of mind and soul and body. 
And then from page 677 and 678, with unutterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy of the wisdom of unfallen beings. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding gained through ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. With undimmed vision, they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things, from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written, and in all are the riches of his power displayed. End of quote. And then continuing in page 678, the great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, why do you think God has allowed sin to go on for so long? At the same time, no human being suffers in this world longer than their own existence here. That is, no one suffers more than his or her own lifetime. How short is a human lifetime compared to the thousands of years of sin? How might this perspective help us deal with the difficult question of evil? And two, how does the thousand-year period, known as the millennium, fit into the plan of salvation? Think about what it says about the character of God that not until all of the redeemed will have had a chance to see the justice and fairness and love of God will final judgment be brought upon the lost. And that brings us to the end of the reading of the Adult Bible Study Guide for the second quarter of 2022. I trust that you've profited from these lessons and that the reading of it has been a blessing to you and your family and your community. And both myself, Percy Harold, and my niece, Sibylla, who reads the Inside Story each week, want to wish you much of God's blessing in your life. And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Refuge for Russian Speakers by Andrew McChesney Ukrainian pastor Vadim Krinikny faced a major challenge finding a building for a Russian-speaking church in the Spanish city of Valencia. But with prayer, he managed to lease a hall seating 100 people in the city centre for a token 500 euro, which equates to $550 a month. It is worth much more, Vadim said. The hall was large for an initial group of 26 worshippers, but Vadim got to work on outreach programs. The church began to host a get-together with a meal on Sundays. Russian-speaking children were invited to special activities. Additional programs were organised around such holidays as New Year's and Easter. Concerts proved especially popular, filling the church to overflowing and sometimes requiring the rental of a larger hall. The church forged strong ties with the local Russian-speaking community and became a centre for Russian speakers. About 80% of Spain's estimated 400,000 Russian speakers live in Valencia and along the nearby Mediterranean coast. Of those 400,000 people, at least 500 are Adventists. But the first person baptised at the new church was not from Russia or another former Soviet republic. The woman was born in Iran and had been raised in a non-Christian world religion. She spoke Russian fluently after studying for 12 years in the former Soviet Republic of Belarus. And she came to the church after someone invited her off the street. After 25 baptisms and several former Adventist families recommitted their hearts to Jesus, weekly church attendance stood at 65 adults and 40 children, when the conflict erupted in the Ukraine in 2022. 
Vadim realized with astonishment that the church was well positioned to help people fleeing the conflict. The church quickly used its local connections to establish a refugee centre. In the first two months of the conflict, 200 people visited the centre, receiving lodging and food. About half of them were Adventists. Since then, many more people have received assistance. Many have come to us knowing no one in Spain, Vadim said. But they come to us because we speak Russian and they seek something familiar. He credited God for positioning the church to help refugees even before the conflict started. He said he longed to share the hope of Jesus' soon coming with them and all Russian speakers in Spain. We are concentrating all our efforts on meeting the needs of these people, he said. Your 13th Sabbath offering this Sabbath will help spread the gospel in the Euro-Asian division, the home of many Russian speakers. Thank you for planning a generous offering.